I want to tell you to, this morning about something that's near and dear to all of the hearts of scholars, particularly here at UC Berkeley. And Berkeley is a great place, you all know that. One of the things that makes us particularly strong is our ability to publish our scholarship in the very best scientific journals, in the case of the life sciences and physical sciences. But lately, things have gone bad. The system is broken. There are problems with the review of scientific papers, and in particular, there are problems with your ability to read scientific papers freely online. And that's what I'm going to discuss in the next few minutes. The big problem is the system is broken for scientific review. We know if you've ever experienced having a scientific paper reviewed by other scholars, that some people just get mean and nasty when they're reading their paper, your papers because they can hide behind their anonymity. The peer review system is broken. Here's an example of a paper that I happen to serve as an editor on in a journal and the nasty response that I got from the scholar whose paper was rejected. Dear editor, I'm sitting in the smallest room in my house with your review in front of me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> what makes people so angry? The problem is the way papers are reviewed by other scholars. It's a nasty system. You have to run the gauntlet to have your papers favorably considered. And the problem is created by journals that artificially restrict your access to these publications. They hide their papers behind a commercial firewall and you, as an independent reader, are unable to see those papers, particularly if, you're not, if you don't happen to be at the university, unless you pay, and you're paying very often for work that has, is publicly funded. Why should that be? So, scholars all over the world know that this is a problem, and they've even made their point in some of the journals that are particular offenders, and I'll point out two of them in, in, that are serious offenders. One is Nature Magazine, a commercial, very successful journal, but one that's very expensive to the university, and particularly expensive if, if you, as an independent reader, want to read what's in them. Scientists, including those shown here on this slide, suffer because of the unnecessary delays and expense in publishing their work. In fact, as a scholar, very often you feel that it's some anonymous evil person who's evaluated your work and is finally the one that has done you in. So who is this evil person and why are there such artificial restrictions on your ability to publish your work and eventually to read the work of other people? One of the problems is an anachronism. In the 21st century, there is no reason to limit one's access to scientific publications by having a print model. None of you who read the scientific literature will ever even look at a hard copy of a journal. And yet the commercial journals, the strongest, most popular journals, are ones that insist on having their scientific papers published in print and limit the number of papers and the number of pages that they will accept based on a limited print run. Let me give you an example. Science Magazine. You've all heard of Science Magazine. A very important venue for the most important work indeed of many Berkeley scholars have published in Science Magazine. Science prints 50 pages of content a week. This is to cover the entire scientific world. Indeed, the entire world of science and yet only 50 pages. That means that if you are successful in getting your work accepted for science, you are limited in the number of words that you can express to cover your material, and often much of the work is cast aside, relegated to, to a supplement that no one reads. As a result of this pressure, only 6% of the papers that are submitted to Science Magazine are published, and that means that 94% of you uh, end up being frustrated and wasting a lot of time and money. Well, we're in flux. There are many different styles that are used to evaluate scientific literature. There are journals that are run commercially, like Science and Nature. There are journals that are run by scientific societies. 
There are people who are professional editors who work for these journals and who are paid to make decisions. And there are scholars, university professors, who are actively engaged in the review and decision-making process itself. So what can we do to reform this, to make the process more open, and in particular to democratize scientific publication? Around 15 years ago, a very important principle was established, launched here in part by my colleague Michael Eisen, a, a, a phenomenon called open access. Open access means that you, as a reader of science, have the ability to go online and to read a paper free of charge. Uh, the author has to pay the page charges. They're paid sometimes by institutions. But the uh, client, the person who is interested in understanding the science, can go online and find and have access directly. Suppose uh, you leave the university and you're now a private citizen. You read something in the newspaper about an important discovery and you want to get into the details of it. If a paper is in an open access journal, you can go right online and read the content. So where have we gone in the field of open access? There are now a number of journals that offer open access content. The literature is growing dramatically in open access journals. It's something that we really want to encourage. But still, at least in the life sciences, it represents only about 10% uh, of the literature. So this is something that is at the cutting edge of scientific publication, something that many of us here at the university feel strongly about promoting. Now, another limitation that you may not know about is that scholars often weigh their uh, value by a number that journals, particularly commercial journals, have created called the impact factor, which is a crude measurement of the number of citations that a paper generates divided by the number of papers that are published by that journal. Commercial journals use this number, really a kind of a trumped up number, to add value uh, to sell themselves. It's really, they're in the business of selling magazines and they trump up this impact factor. Now, this has created distortions in uh, the scientific world. And one distortion that I want to share with you, you won't be able to read this, it's in Chinese, but here's a, a, an amazing document that was published by the Chinese Academy of Sciences last year, which is basically an, a, an award notice or a bribe notice for scholars to publish in the three most selective venues. These are journals called Science, Nature, and Cell. They accept only a tiny fraction of the literature in the entire life science world. They are one of only three journals in a, in a, in a world of thousands of titles. And yet, uh, in China, they value their scholarly output so much that they will give cash bribes to scholars who succeed in the lottery in getting their work published in these journals. Uh, the figure that you can't see here is uh, $33,000 into the pocket of an individual who happens to be lucky enough to have their work published in Cell Nature of Science and much less to scholars who publish in other journals. This, this is an enormous distortion. It cheapens the value of scholarship and it causes scholars, I think, to cut corners and ultimately to make their work appear more appealing than it actually is. So what, what can we do about this? A number of scientists have gathered together to sign a petition, a document called DORA, which is the Declaration of Research Assessment. You can go online and find this document if you wish and read the principles that scholars have put forward to try to defeat the influence of these very selective commercial venues that control and, and uh, really uh, uh, influence, I think, negatively the output of scholarship around the world. So I urge you to do that if you're interested in this subject. I also urge you to look at one of the new entrants in the open access community. It's a journal that I happen to edit. It's called eLife. It's sponsored by three of the most prominent biomedical funders in the world, uh, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, the Wellcome Trust, and the Max Planck Society. And you can go on and read anything in this journal free of charge. And we hope that journals like this and other open access journals will eventually uh, bring scholarship to the, um, to the community in an openly accessible manner. So for those of you interested in this, I urge you uh, to pay attention when you participate in the publication process and try to convince your mentors 
that you want to have your work published in that manner. Thank you.